Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Before we get into today's episode, don't forget Trish Regan is now a part of the Stansberry family. Check out her podcast, American Consequences with Trish Regan. The link will be in the description of this episode. Today, we will talk with Yoav Sharon of Driehaus Capital. Yoav works on a fund that focuses totally on event-driven investing. We have never talked about this. I can't wait to talk about this, to this one guy who specializes in this thing we know nothing about. It's going to be awesome. In the mailbag, we'll talk about Bitcoin, 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 gold, zombies, and commodities. In my opening rant this week, hey, I told you about Kathy Woods and ARK Investment Management, and I was dead right, though admittedly very lucky on the timing. We'll talk about that and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So, hey, look, I, I, I got lucky on timing, but I kind of called it a little bit here. I said, I said in two places, right? I said in, in the episode last week, and I also said in my uh, Stansberry Daily Digest recently that ARK Investment Management's ETFs, this firm founded by Kathy Woods, who appears on, in the media a lot. She was on Bloomberg again this morning. I said that it was basically a sign of the top, right? If you look at all the ARK ETFs and, and the ticker symbols for all, almost all of them are ARK and then like ARKK, ARKG, ARKF, etc. And one of them is PRNT. I think that's the 3D printer ETF. And they're, all the charts are ballistic, and what did I say? A ballistic chart goes straight up, like a ballistic missile, right? And they don't, when they correct, they don't go sideways. They crash. Now, I'm not saying that, that what's happened in the past couple of days here, earlier this week, was a crash. However, <laughs> however, Bitcoin was down and Tesla was down. And those are the two big holdings. She's got Tesla as the biggest position in three of her ETFs. And like ARK-K was down 16%, ARK-G was down 15%. Those aren't big numbers. I mean, they're big numbers for a day or two for an ETF. But more to the point, they suffered their biggest ever outflows. And overall, their ETFs lost about $3 billion out of the $60 billion in them. Between the, the, the share prices of their assets falling and between the, the you know, people redeeming, basically, the money flowing out of the funds. They lost about three billion, just like that. Boom, a couple of days, from from Friday through Tuesday, uh, I think. So this is just it's it's a toppy thing, right? It looks very it, it's exactly what happens at the top, right? The the most popular thing that everybody's in love with, which you got to admit, Tesla and Bitcoin are what everybody's in love with, and by association, Kathy Woods Arc funds. Are, you know, they hold plenty of Tesla, Bitcoin, and lots of other new disruptive technologies. And right, I gave her credit all day long for starting this thing in 2014. 2014, she started this company to focus on disruptive technology. What a great call, right? Great call. And th some of the funds actually kind of have gone sideways, not done great. But, you know, overall, they've done great. They've, they've, they went from, you know, I think they had like, three or five billion in assets maybe a year ago or two years ago or something and now it's like 60 it's incredible so you know she gets all the credit all day long do not misunderstand what i'm saying i'm not saying kathy wood is stupid and her funds are stupid no no one of the points we made remember that george soros makes and we talked about this last week is that these like bubbles and speculative manias they're based in reality the internet really was the most amazing thing, but the dot-com bubble was still a huge bubble and there were a lot of garbage companies that needed to go away. And it crashed, like all bubbles do. But hey, you know, Amazon and Google and Facebook and Apple and all these big companies, you know, they've done phenomenally well. 
and the internet has become an amazing force in our lives. So there's lots of truth in what Kathy is doing at ARC, and I admire her for it. But I'm sorry, it, that's not the only thing that determines a great investment. You know, there's all kinds of other stuff, the fundamentals of the companies, and the fundamentals of Tesla aren't that great, you know? I mean, it's more than the next 10 car companies. It's valued higher than the next 10 car companies, publicly traded companies combined. And, you know, they produce combined like, you know, it's at least 20 or 30, I think it's like 30 million cars a year, some huge number like that, right? And, you know, Tesla makes like half a million, you know, half a million a year. It, it, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. The stock is way, 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 way ahead of itself. And then he discloses that he bought Bitcoin. Oh, and that's, you know, another reason to own Tesla for some reason. It's, it's all ridiculous, right? It's gotten ridiculous. It's gotten too speculative. And Kathy Woods and ARK, I said, it's, it's a symptom. It's a sign of the time. And Tesla and Bitcoin get hit. Money starts running out the door in record amounts. And all of a sudden, whoa, 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 you know, these funds seem like a bad idea all of a sudden. Now, do I think this is it? Do I think this is the end? Eh, maybe. You know, tops, market tops are a process. It takes a while. And it's very volatile. I don't think this is necessarily the top, but it's part of the top for sure. It's part of it. This is exactly what happens, right? The frothiest, most optimistic, overvalued, ballistic, straight up on the chart, garbage, I shouldn't say garbage, stuff, there is a lot of garbage in it, but stuff, you know, it, it starts to fall apart. And, you know, the story is going to get worse. And we had our, our listener, I think it was James W. wrote in last week, and he said, hey, man, you got a bad grade on the, we, I didn't read his question, but he wrote in and said, you got a bad grade on the Stansberry, you know, report card, and, and you're criticizing Kathy Woods. Just wait for the other shoe to drop, James. That's all I'm going to say, right? And and our grades are a lot different than the kind of grades she's getting, right? Our grades are they're very well thought out, and, and, I, and the grades she's getting are just based on what the returns were in the last three years. That's it. So be careful. The money will, can and will and does run out the door like gangbusters as quickly as it ran in, faster than it ran in right? Faster even. I bet they never took in $3 billion in a couple of days. <laughs> so yeah, just be careful. And, and I think for me, ARC is sort of, it's a little bit like Lehman Brothers, though not nearly as egregious. Because it, it, the way in which it's like Lehman, I, and we said in Extreme Value in the newsletter I write for Stansberry, we shorted Lehman in April 2009. And of course, it went bankrupt like September of that year. So it was a great short. And, and we found everything about that bubble under one roof. There was leverage at 30 or 33 to 1. There was dramatically overvalued real estate and private equity all in one package. I think they had bought a big piece of the Archstone Trust deal, as I recall. And there were like level one and two and three assets, or like level one assets are things that you can just look at the market price and it's liquid and you can value it instantly. And then level two and three, it's like, you know, the company has more leeway. And I was asking, how come the level one assets are way the hell down and the level two and three assets have not been marked down? It's ridiculous, right? And it's all the same stuff. It's just a less liquid version. So there was no way uh, that it should have been that way. And of course, it turned out horribly and Lehman, Lehman disappeared after a you know, century or so long history. It was, it was, it was tragic. And I hope it doesn't turn out tragic for Kathy Wood. Cause I think, you know, she's done a great thing, but she is a sign of the bubble and she does have everything under one roof because she set out to be the ETF company or the fund company that, that buys disruptive innovation. So this is a huge tech bubble. So what, you know, is she's got every bubbly technology under one roof. And she's selling debt against it too. So, you know, we get to have that under one roof and, and there's Bitcoin in there and we get to have that and there's Tesla, we get to have that. It's just, you know, it's it's got everything under one roof, everything about this bubble under one roof. 
All right, I, I think I've made my point, okay? I, I sound like I want to dance on Kathy Wood's grave, and I really don't. I'm just kind of doing a tiny little victory lap, teeny tiny victory lap, because it just so happened that right when I'm warning everybody about the ARC funds going ballistic, they had a real bad week. That's all I'm saying, okay? And, and I yes, I think it's worth saying, because I think it's worth identifying everything about a bubble that you can identify. And when you get it right, you got to say, okay, we've got a handle on this. We got this right. We understand it. And that's what I'm saying this week, okay? All right. It is time, once again, for my quote of the week. This is a quote by Nassim Taleb, and he wrote a really cool little book called The Bed of Procrustes, which is all – it's basically a book full of quotes because it's a book full of aphorisms, philosophical and practical aphorisms, it's called. So, you know, everything in the whole book is just like one short little a short little one and two liners kind of thing. And this is a quote about the stock market that I think is just perfect for this moment. And he says, the stock market in brief, participants are calmly waiting in line to be slaughtered while thinking it is for a Broadway show. <laughs> that's the whole quote. And that's what happens at the top, right? Everybody is most excited to be in the market and most optimistic around the top, right? And, and I've talked before, and I'll talk again, topping is a process, right? It's not a single event. It happens over a period of time. Stocks become very volatile. They're up, they're down, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're just not up anymore. Uh, but it can take quite a while. It can take months or even a year or more. And that's, I, I believe that's what we're going through now. And, and so at the top, that's when everybody is, is just so happy to be in the market, and yet they're really like waiting in line to be slaughtered. So maybe I'll read it one more time, then we'll move on. The stock market in brief, participants are calmly waiting in line to be slaughtered while thinking it is for a Broadway show. Perfect. All right. Let's go now and talk with our guest, Yoav Sharon. Let's do it right now. If you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know I don't make a lot of recommendations on investments. However, for a short time, I will be sharing not just any recommendation, but my number one recommendation right now. This is the one where if you said, Dan, I'm going to put a gun to your head. You got to put all your money in one stock. What would it be? It would be this one. Easy. It would be an easy decision. Now, my Extreme Value newsletter readers are the only people who can get access to this recommendation, but I did do a video recently to share my story about this company and one of the main people behind it. So if you're interested, we sat me down in my house and, and they put a camera and a microphone in front of me. So if you want to see me get really, really worked up about one of my investment ideas on camera, this is, this is your chance. And I am worked up. It's an incredibly cheap stock. I think it can return something like, you know, like 10 times your money over the long term, like over the next five to 10 years, something like that. And, I, and I'll tell you in the video why I think it's the perfect moment for this stock. It's just, it's the right stock at the right moment with the right management team, right business model. It's awesome. So if you want to see the video we did, visit extremevaluevideo.com. You got to get in before it's too late. The video won't be up forever. It won't be up very long at all. Again, this is the one stock I'd put all my money into if you made me do it. Website again is extremevaluevideo.com. Check it out. Today's guest is Yoav Sharon. Yoav Sharon is a portfolio manager for the Dry House event driven strategy. He's responsible for idea generation, portfolio construction, security selection, and investment research. Mr. Sharon has 16 years of industry experience with 13 years as a buy side investor and has been a senior member of the Dry House alternative investment team for eight years. He joined Dry House Capital Management in 2012. Yoav, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. So the first thing that I'm curious about is, were you one of these guys who bought their first stock when they were 10 years old, or did finance sort of show up in your life later on? Oh, that's interesting. Um, no, I, I definitely was not one of those uh, one of those kids, uh, you know, looking up the stock quotes in the paper uh, at age eight or 11. Um, I was too busy, I think, uh, 
being engaged in sports. Um, but uh, once I, uh, I took an econ class in, in high school, uh, and that I think kind of started the path toward uh, being interested in, you know, essentially economics and finance and obviously through college and, and post-college that, that was how um, my world unfolded. Right. I, I, I find that with lots of folks, they just, they discover it in college and, and get bit by it and then that's it for the rest of their career. So I just want to jump right in here and, and talk about event driven strategy. I don't even think we've ever discussed this topic one time in a couple of years now of, do, of me doing this podcast. So maybe the first thing you need to do, Yoav, is tell us what the heck event driven means. Sure. Yeah. No. That's it's it's a great point. I mean, obviously, event driven, uh, both from from an AUM standpoint in the marketplace and, and from a strategy perspective, is can be broad, but um, is it also in a way kind of niche? Um, <clears throat> the, the easiest way to think about event driven investing is that sleeve in the market or that area of opportunity in the market that's really focused on idiosyncratic opportunities. Um, so, you know, obviously there's, there's two broad ways to gain exposure to the market. Uh, you have beta or, you know, traditional long only uh, asset classes. Uh, and then you also have uh, a focus or an area of opportunity on alpha generation, essentially stripping out the market exposures or the market risk that's associated with investing and really trying to isolate and identify idiosyncratic situations. So, you know, if you think of a, of a traditional investing where, you know, if you had like a pie chart and maybe beta is uh, accounting for 80% of that pie chart and then idiosyncratic or alpha generation is accounting for say 20% of the return generation as well as, as the risk exposures. Um, if you think about event driven investing, it's flipped on its head. So the lion's share of return generation and essentially the focus of event-driven investing is to isolate these idiosyncratic opportunities, these, these catalysts, if you will, in order to drive returns while eliminating or hedging or you know, minimizing all the market factors, uh, whether it's style factors or industries or, or just broad beta. Um, and I think what that what that produces or as a result of that, what you are able to achieve is uh, obviously alpha generation when done well, but also um, limited correlation to broader markets, less volatility to broader markets, uh, better pro performance or uh, preservation of capital during periods of drawdowns. So those are those are kind of the, the, the key tenets or the cores of event driven investing. In essence, focus on uh, company specific idiosyncratic catalysts that are going to unlock value or accrue value throughout the capital structure and less of a focus on the broader market. So Yoav, if I just bring up a chart of dry house event driven for our listeners, ticker symbol DEVDX, I sort of see the, you know, the lower volatility, maybe in general, until, you know, until we get to like the last, you know, 11 months or so, and off the bottom of the of the COVID bear market, just call it, you know, late March of last year, you guys are looking. I don't know if I'd say ballistic, but up forty percent is that's that's a big year for you guys. I mean, most people don't think of volatility as going in both directions, but I sort of do. So maybe I'm wrong to do that. But what are you holding? I noticed when I looked on the on the website that you guys are holding a lot of cash, but but stocks did edge out cash as the largest asset class. What are you holding that just took off like that? Sure. Um, so I would say uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, one should think about volatility both up and down, you know, kind of essentially the difference between, say, sharp ratio or Sortino. Um, my, my original background in financial markets was uh, as a derivatives trader, an options uh, market maker on the exchange at the CBOE. So, you know, volatility is kind of embedded in my core. So I think your point is, is spot on. Um, we've historically as a fund been able to produce our returns and, and produce these outcomes while limiting the fund volatility to, you know, roughly half that of the, of the broader market using the S and P as a benchmark. Um, uh, some of that is a function of the type of, of investments we make. Some of that is a function of, you know, having some cash or particularly hedging out certain exposures that are either 
unwanted or, or unintended. Um, we also employ, which is one of uh, of our distinctions or unique characteristic, because there's kind of two main school of thoughts in event driven investing. One is kind of a siloed approach, say uh, someone who does merger arb or a fund that does merger arb and only invests in merger arb. So when that opportunity set dries up, they either have to extend on the risk spectrum or they're limited in opportunity. We we employ a multi-strategy, multi-asset class approach. So that certainly also helps uh, with correlation and volatility. You know, if we are seeing really good opportunities in, in credit investments, that'll dampen volatility. Or if we see really attractive opportunities in arbitrage situations, that can that can dampen volatility. To to kind of pull pull back the the layers of the onion to your question on you know the last year or so, um, we came into 2020. Um, you know, we, we obviously write our, our year-end letters and kind of our outlooks and thoughts for the year on a quarterly basis. But we came into 2020 thinking that our opportunity set was was pretty robust, but we weren't uh, overly extended in terms of risk. I wouldn't say we were defensive, but we were, you know, cautious to moving forward at a measured pace. And uh our ability to withstand the severe drawdown, uh, you know, that generational drawdown we saw there at Q1. Well, while we did experience some of some of the drawdown, it was it was roughly a third of, of the broader market, and that really allowed us to capitalize on the opportunity set that expanded dramatically um, in the first few months of of 2020. For example, risk arbitrage spreads in the beginning of February uh, were probably trading at a one percent gross basis, implying upper 90s percent uh, of deal closure probability. And within a matter of, of weeks in March, that widened out to 20% gross spreads and an implied probability across the universe of 60-ish percent. So we were able to deploy capital given that we were insulated and, and sheltered from, from much of the drawdown. Um, and in addition to that, um, SPACs were an area that opened up as an opportunity set for us, as well as um, credit opportunities when you know, we really saw in mid-March just indiscriminate selling of credit. So it, it was kind of a, a confluence of a few things, um, you know, just to summarize it or to, to kind of recap it. You know, we were positioned appropriately going into um, the unfortunate pandemic, which allowed us to uh, be insulated or withstand the dramatic moves, but more importantly, then capitalize um, on the opportunity set as it evolved quickly. And we think that's a real benefit of the multi-strategy, multi-asset class approach. Um, we just view it to be more optimal than than being limited to only one, you know, essentially one type of sandbox to play in. Whereas um, a siloed approach might might be limited. We we have an opportunity to really move and really allocate capital where the opportunity set not only on a return basis because you know it's not how we think of the world, but really on a risk-adjusted basis. How how and where the most compelling risk adjusted returns are we will allocate the capital to that i see you go where the opportunity is you have a broad kind of mandate that's really good for for a fund you and it's rare too isn't it like most people are stuck in a box and and you either want to own that industry or that asset class or whatever it is or or they're out of luck i, I guess part of the broadness is just event driven itself right you guys you list some of the um on the little uh, fact sheet on your website, you list some of the special situations, M&A, mergers and acquisitions. You're talking about merger ARB, spinoffs, restructurings, complex business models as a, as a special situation or, a, or an event. Complex business models. Tell me about that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, so we've, as a team, uh, we obviously have extensive experience uh, investing, particularly on the buy side, uh, collectively over, you know, 80 years as, as a group. And, and we've amassed uh, or, you know, cobbled together expertise in, in certain areas within the marketplace. Um, so we have areas that we continually go back to, but uh, to your point earlier, we also have the mandate that allows us to, you know, really move capital or allocate capital or learn and, and go into a new area when the opportunity presents itself. I think oftentimes what happens um, in event-driven investing is because, you know, as you said, it, uh, something might not fit neatly into a box, it gets, um, you know, pushed to the side or left to the side. And, and that could be either because of um, 
you know, it's too niche or perhaps uh, situational complexity, you know, where you have, let's say, a large reorg occurring throughout a capital structure. And if, if you're an equity only investor, then, you know, you maybe can't see the, the full picture of how the value is going to accrue throughout the capital structure and more importantly, where the best risk adjusted opportunity is. And, and, and quite frankly, we also see that in risk arbitrage opportunities. Sometimes, um, sometimes we see situations where different asset classes have wildly different implied probabilities of deal closure and our ability to not be forced to only participate in the equity risk arbitrage uh, allows us to, to recreate the essentially the deal spread at, at a lower implied probability and therefore a better risk adjusted return. So particularly with respect to complex, um, you know, business situations, you know, that generic term. Um, I think we have a couple industries where where we have uh, a competitive advantage and we've, we've developed frameworks and uh, have deep expertise in order to really understand what's what's occurring, not only from an industry level, but also from from a security level and, and how to think about um, when and how value will, will accrete to an investment idea. You know, I'd, I'd call out um, financials or changing landscape in financials is an area where, where we spend a lot of time or, or have recently, but also, you know, healthcare is something that we have a consistent exposure to, uh, particularly in the, uh, life sciences space and development stage therapeutics. Uh, one of my, one of my colleagues, co-PM on the fund, Mike Caldwell has really developed and in, instilled, developed and, um, you know, cre- created a robust framework for how we assess probability of success and and how we think the market um, consistently misprices that. Well, one thing that our fund focuses a lot on um, is is kind of the concept of probability of success. Um, we want to get a lot, we want to get our events right, quote unquote. Um, that's important. We think over time that'll that'll accrue value to to the fund and, and it has and and to couple that when when the opportunity arises, to couple it with you know attractive skew um, and, and downside protection, and and we think those two levers, getting our events right and uh, recreating attractive skew, have a very powerful impact on not only returns but really like the return profile, the return stream of the fund. Yeah, so I want I do want to talk about you know increasing the probability of getting the events right because. Personally, I've done a very small amount of merger arb, just sort of buying target companies, you know, mm-hmm. um, if there's a decent if there's a decent spread available, which, you know, there often has not been. Right. But every now and then you find one. And I wonder, you know, I have a couple of markers that I look for that I think increase the probability. For example, I remember this company, Cvent, was being bought out by a private equity firm that was rolling up these, you know, event management type companies. And so it knew everything about them. It was the biggest event company that wasn't, you know, already private. And they had financing up the wazoo, you know, cheap financing was easy to get. So I knew that I knew that that could happen. And it just looked like a kind of a no brainer. And there was like a, I don't know, double digit spread on it. And and it worked out. It was great. But what what are your markers for for just like merger arb? How how do you look at a merger arb and say, you know, this merger has a much higher probability of happening. Therefore, it's worth a bet. Right. No, that's that's precisely how we approach it. You know, whether it's a framework or a checklist. Um, and and we've developed it, and you know, it's become more robust, and we've refined it over the years. And actually, twenty twenty was a really interesting test case because. Um, as an aside, what ultimately ended up being the most important thing in 2020 was was actually not the strength of the definitive definitive merger agreement or the DMA as it's known, but really the buyer willingness to proceed with the deal. Because we saw a bunch of fairly high profile deals where the buyers had pretty significant buyer's remorse and, and were either slow playing it or essentially trying to to scuttle the deal. Um, I think when, when, when I think about the framework or, or the checklist of what we find attractive, you know, you do want to find strong uh, buyer incentives. You want the buyer to be motivated. Uh, easier said than done, but it's really important. You obviously go through the, the DMA to make sure that there's, there's no meaningful outs and that the contract is tight. Although, as, as I said previously, last year kind of proved that that is not as important potentially as maybe people used to think. 
It's also important if it's a if it's a repeat buyer, a, a serial buyer, someone who, you know, their deal completion reputation is important because they're going to be in the markets again. You know, particularly, you know, it's a it's a little bit of a gray area with private equity buyers or private sponsors, but you know, they're they're if they're going to keep doing deals, they're going to want to keep coming back to the markets. They're also going to need financing, so uh, a buyer's ability to raise the financing. Um, the the termination fee, uh, how hefty it is, uh, the language and the carve outs. You know, it's it's essentially an, a checklist that you go down and say, okay, based on all these attributes, what should the probability of deal closure be? And then, you know, obviously the, you, your downside uh, it comes into play there. Uh, but then also, how differentiated is you know our view of probability of deal close relative to the market? So uh, on one hand, there's an absolute value component to it. You know, is is a deal that's pricing a 90% probability of close in the next six weeks at a 3% growth spread, you know, or maybe annualizing at 12%, something like that. Is that a good value on its own? And then is it also a good value relative to what people are expecting and or other parts of the capital structure are saying and other deals out in the marketplace? So that's kind of how... Once we do the checklist and we we find a deal that we think is attractive, we'll then triangulate it and get a sense of do we think it's it's not only attractive on a standalone basis, but how does it stack up relative to other opportunities? And that and that kind of holds through, holds true for for how we think about um, where our capital gets allocated as is. Um, it's all done from a bottom up standpoint, you know, fundamental research on a particular situation, but. Inevitably, what happens is is how much capital we have allocated in one area is indicative of how that how those individual opportunities look, but also how that opportunity set looks relative to the other strategies or asset class opportunities we we operate in. Okay, gotcha. You know, I keep thinking about something as you talk about other topics that I wanted to mention for the listeners. It sounded like your answer to my sort of volatility in both directions question was basically you have such a broad mandate and so many things got so cheap in March of last year that of course you were going to be up 40%. You know, of course it was going to be a huge gain after that. Since that doesn't normally happen, you don't normally have years like that. And and now what I'm wondering now is like if I if I perceive how how you guys operate and if I look at the the history since inception of the returns this could be like a new higher level that you're operating from now because, you know, you, you sort of did a, a good job of exactly what you're trying to do, reducing volatility over the past years. And now you got this big push up courtesy of the pandemic. And now here you are with more assets and, and kind of a bigger, bigger amount of capital to work with, period. Have I, have I described all that right? And if so, what does that larger you know, amount of capital mean for you? You're, you're still not so big that you can't keep operating the same way, right? For example. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're nowhere near uh, a level, you know, we, we have a mutual fund. We also have some separately managed accounts, um, SMAs that we, that we uh, manage. So, but we're nowhere near a level in terms of an asset, asset level that we're, we're anywhere close to being limited by the opportunity set. Now, part of that is because we have, you know, Back to that sandbox analogy, multiple sandboxes to to operate in. Um, with respect to the the volatility point that that you circled back on, I mean, I would never say that. Of course, forty percent is something <laughs> that should be expected. You know, we think of this fund as um, equity like returns with better um, downside protection, lower volatility, uncor- you know, limited correlation. You know, for context, our correlation over the last year to the S and P is you know, roughly 0.59, just under 0.6. Uh, our one-year beta to the S&P is 0.23. We're really focused on idiosyncratic situations and alpha is going to drive our returns. You know, last year alpha accounted for something like low 80s percentage of our overall return. So it's just an entirely different game. Uh, certainly the dramatic risk-off period in Q1 last year uh, opened up an opportunity set that doesn't, you know, it doesn't come along every, every quarter, but what we have seen in, in 20, 2019 was a really good example because, you know, we, we were also able to have a very successful year 
um, you know, just just shy of twenty percent. With again, you know, similar similar uh, attribution and metrics, where you know everything was most of the stuff was coming from alpha. Um, you know, protecting downside. Um, you know, over the over the past four four years during during down months in the S and P, the fund's been able to be up in roughly half of those, and we've outperformed the S and P by over forty five hundred basis points during those you know during those periods where where investors need or want it the most, you know, essentially capital preservation, which, you know, not taking the drawdown allows you to then start compounding capital when positive returns come back to the marketplace. Um, I think, I think what, what's over the, over the years, we've obviously refined our process and, and we enhanced it. And uh, our opportunity set has expanded because we've learned more and, you know, maybe a theme that continually comes through, uh, in our investing approach, which kind of dovetails with volatility, is oftentimes we're looking for value or, or you know, che- quote unquote cheap optionality, optionality that isn't fully appreciated in the marketplace. Whether that be, um, you know, playing a risk arb spread through uh, the credit portion of the structure, where the implied probability is much lower and the market is mispricing that optionality, or whether it's uh, we've been investing in SPACs, as I mentioned, for you know probably four or five years. And a couple of years ago, it really started uh, picking up. And you know, much has been written about and talked about what's happened over the last year. So obviously, that that opportunity set has accelerated and gotten a lot more attention. But the fact that we were operating in that sandbox five years ago and were aware of it and stayed on top of it and and knew what knew it well enough to know that when the opportunity set changed, we could capitalize on it. You know, another example of uh, an asset or a strategy opportunity set or optionality, but also within SPACs themselves, there's this embedded optionality that we viewed was was being and, and still is being somewhat um, underestimated in the marketplace or, or even misunderstood and, and has been a consistent area of, of opportunity for the last, you know, couple of years. So, but I think, you know, Having said all that, obviously 2020 was unprecedented on on many levels, and you know we wrote a lot about that. Just how unprecedented it was, nearly in in every sense, um, and it was you know it was you know awful to to have to go through it all. But it it didn't really change our investing approach. It didn't change our process. It didn't change you know the core tenets of of what the fund was trying to do. And just like in the last two years, we've had. Outsized returns, you know, we 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 don't you know guide to those or think that those are you know are, are right every year. I mean, we think we think we view the fund as as an equity like return, so that's you know mid to high single digits on an annualized basis. But we're going to do it in a unique way with limited correlation, less volatility, and we're going to protect on the downside. And you know, our view is that that's an attractive um, offering. That's an attractive offering to investors both that are you know looking to get returns but then also ones that are looking to be uncorrelated so there's there's you know it, it can work as a complement in a portfolio for for an asset allocator uh, as a diversifier or it can also plug a hole for the return stream in in an asset allocators uh model okay so let's let's talk about you know hedging downside risk and let's talk about you know how you because it, it you, you've mentioned it and you know that's part of what you do if you're trying to reduce volatility, right? But on the other hand, you have you have to admit, like, you know, over the past just call it 11 years now, it has often been a really bad idea to do that, right? It's often been a a good idea to just not worry about it and and not lose money on hedges. So, but you're, I notice, I, I look through the, you know, the return since inception and, and three year and five year, and you guys have done just fine, you know, between fine and great, frankly, H- how do you, how do you do it? What, what are you doing that is different from people who are tired of losing their ass on their hedges? It's, it's, it's a great, um, it's a great point. So I, I would make one subtle distinction before I'll probably start getting a little geeky in terms of options and derivatives and thoughts on hedging. Cause it's kind of core to my, to my, my background, but, you know, I think being hedged over the last 10 years, I wouldn't necessarily say was a bad decision. Um, 
you know, it detracted from returns. So you could say it was a bad outcome potentially. But I think I think the real problem with the way folks approach hedging is they don't have a good understanding of a what they're trying to hedge, how much it's actually costing them, and what to expect when they need the hedge to work. Um, you know, we've always ran hedged products at Driehaus uh, on our alternatives platform. We have a good understanding of uh, essentially, you know, for lack of a better term, like an insurance risk budget, but also really understanding that not everything can be hedged. You want, when you do hedge, you want to be able to hedge cost effectively or efficiently. You want to match your hedge to what the risks actually are. And then you also have to, to understand that sometimes there are unintended or unwanted risks. Uh, or even risk that you've identified that can't be hedged well or efficiently. And and then, you know, sometimes the best hedge is to reduce exposure or trim. Um, so I, I think where people get in trouble with hedging or, um, you know, the the fatigue with hedging is not really understanding what folks are signing up for or what one is signing up for. And then also having very little to show uh, when there is risk off. And, and part of that over the last 10 years, to your point, has been that, you know, essentially every every risk off period has been met with a as strong a risk on period immediately after and pretty quickly. I mean, even if you think about last year, I mean, pretty wild to think that we were down, you know, 35% and had one of the largest drawdowns, uh, you know, in the market's history. And then within a matter of six weeks, we, we were back in a bull market and, and then regained it all or, or something close to that. Um, we we consistently utilize hedging. Um, obviously, it helps with with correlation, with volatility, with downside protection. But it's also it's also core to what we're doing because we're so focused on idiosyncratic situations. We're so focused on the alpha and our you know getting our event right, quote unquote, that we're fine with stripping out those other exposures. Those you know again unintended or intended exposures or consequences because it's not what we're trying to do. So. Of course, if we would not have been hedged last year, we would have made more money. Um, but you know, maybe uh, maybe we wouldn't have been able to take advantage of the opportunity set that opened up in the first quarter as strongly or as boldly with, without hedges. Um, so you know, we pretty consistently carry hedges to areas where we have exposure and areas where we understand. You know, ideally, we would be able to buy every investment. A day before the event happens and then exit it the day after, you know, and, and have no holding period essentially. But clearly that's not how Mr. Market works. Or, you know, sometimes you don't know when the actual event's gonna occur. Sometimes you don't know when the market's gonna uh attribute the value or the value is gonna accrue to the event that you're playing for. So, you know, we recognize that as we aggregate a portfolio of idiosyncratic catalysts, we're gonna pick up exposures. And those are the ones that we want, you know, that are either you know, market exposures, asset class exposures, industries, sectors. And those are the ones that we're uh, not only comfortable with, but that we're actively hedging out because that's not where our focus is. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah. Risk is a funny thing, isn't it? You mentioned, you know, matching the matching the head to exactly what the risk is, I think. I forget the exact phrase you used, but it was something like exactly what the risk is. And as soon as you said that, I'm like, wow. Isn't it? It's hard to tell kind of exactly what the risk is a lot of the time, isn't it? I mean, risk is always the thing that you don't see coming. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's risks that you've identified and then there's risk that you haven't identified. And, you know, I think what, what's difficult with potentially managing risk uh, or, you know, really aligning expectations with, with the risk that you're trying to manage is, you know, no two scenarios are, are likely going to be identical. Right. I mean, what happened in 2008 is not what happened in 2020 is is not what happened uh in january with the with the retail trade is is not what happened you know earlier this week when when markets were risk off so it's constantly changing but you you, you know you constantly need to monitor it and assess and make sure that you know obviously to the best of your ability you are uh matching up the hedge with the exposures um and then, and then adapting when, when it seems like it's, it's not the case or, or it, something has changed. You know, we've, for example, we've been in essentially, obviously like a 30 year 
bull treasury market, but since the financial crisis, I mean, rates and, and QE rates have just gone down, 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 and that's been a prolonged regime. And you know, the last you know year to date, let's call it, uh, we've seen rates rising. So, like, is that something different, or how do you approach it? And you you got to be constantly reassessing and and readdressing your your exposures and and the hedges. Yeah, I mean, I guess ultimately. I'm, I just have this personal sort of pet peeve about being able to quantify risk, right? People talk about quantifying it and, and it's hard, I guess, was my only point. That, that, was, that was probably my only point, really. Um, and you, got, you guys seem to be doing it okay. <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly agree with you. Well, we're, we're trying. I mean, look, we're, we're, very, we're, we're very passionate about what we do. We're very intensive in what we do. Um, you know, we kind of live and breathe this, so that helps. But, but I agree with you. Quantifying, it, quantifying it, you know, and putting things neatly into a model is, is probably, you know, it's not necessarily the answer, but it's it's just another tool in the toolkit. Um, I think really focusing on efficiency of hedging again, easier said than done, but is and and, and really level setting expectations. I think can go a long way uh, in in aiding investors. And, and, you know, therefore not lamenting maybe, oh, this hedge cost me this year from actual returns because just the P&L isn't the whole story from, from the hedging purpose. You know, maybe, maybe putting on a hedge allowed you to, to be potentially bigger in a position or maybe it allowed you to hold through it uh, more confidently or maybe it allowed you to capitalize on something else. So it, it, it's, as, as you noted, it, it, there's a lot of a lot of nodes and a lot of moving parts all going into, into the ball. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what is attributed to what. Right. All right. Well, yeah, it's a complicated topic. We could be on it all day. Right. <laughs> um, right. So we've actually been talking a while and I'm going to ask you my standard final question that I ask all my guests. Okay. And in your case, you have, what you guys do is it's a little more technical than what we're used to discussing on the show. So I wonder if you can sort of, you know, do your best to simplify your answer. So I'm going to ask like double duty on this answer. Okay. And the question is simple. It's like, if you could leave our listener today with one thought, what would it be? Well, I mean, as far as a venture of an investing, I, I would say this, um, it's an it's an area of the market that uh, has a seat at the table. It has a place at the table because of the outcomes it drives. And simply said, um, it's the ability to compound absolute returns, protect downside, and have uncorrelated return streams. And and when you put you know those pillars together, it's it's a it's a strong um, offering. So I, I would say, you know. People who think about investing in areas of the market, um, this is an area that historically, and we believe going forward, will continue to be attractive. All right. Sounds good to me. Anything that will continue to be attractive sounds really good to me. Right. Let's hope. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yes. Good luck, right? And I definitely, we definitely want to have you back. Um, hopefully, like, you know, we won't see another pandemic. So we'll get to see like a more normal sort of, you know, representation of the strategy over time. Yeah, and, right. You know, again, thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Okay. So, yes, that was a bit on the technical side, but I'm glad we did it. You, you, you know, you got to know what's out there, right? If you don't know what's out there, you can't make a real decision. You can think that you're deciding between two or three alternatives and there's like 90, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so we have to talk to people like you, Av, who, who describe, you know, more complex strategies. Like in one fund, they do bond strategies driven by particular events, you know, particular catalysts, deep value, equity catalyst driven trades, portfolio hedging and risk arbitrage and probably other stuff. You know, we talked about complex, you know, capital structures. So <laughs> there's a lot in there. You know, there are probably funds out there that focus on just one. I know there are funds that focus on just one of these many things that these guys have all under one roof. It's pretty cool. 
actually. When if you just go to the website Driehaus, I said Dry House, it's Driehaus, D R I E H A U S dot com. And and then look up the event driven fund, which is right you can look it up right on the front page. And they have a little fact sheet that tells you all about it. It's it's kind of cool. Just to learn about it, you know, if not invest in it. And I'm not recommending it. I'm just, you know, just throwing it out there. All right. That was very cool. Let's do the mailbag. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also give us a call at our new listener feedback line. Call us at 800-381-2357 and tell us what's on your mind. That's 800-381-2357. And indeed, our first question this week comes from our new feedback line. Our listener Alex called in and said this about when I I discussed George Soros' theory of reflexivity, and this is what Alex had to say about it. And I took that a little bit differently than you're taking it. I took it to mean, like, for example, if the Apple company stock is going up, then that then leads to further iPhone sales, which then leads to the stock going up. I get what you're trying to say, that there is sort of a circularity there, but I don't know that that's reflexivity. I think that... um, and, and I might be wrong, but I took it to mean that the fundamentals are improved by the stock going up. And in this case, the fundamentals would be more based on the products that they're trying to sell into uh, the market against their competitors. Apple becomes a winning company and their um, their product looks better in the face of an increasing stock price. And that then helps them as they compete against Samsung, for example. So Alex, I think what you said, especially the example you gave of Apple, I think that's a subset of what I'm talking about. And I was trying to find a quote in the Alchemy of Finance or or Soros on Soros. I mean, Alchemy of Finance has has is like reflexivity for a couple hundred pages. I mean, it's it's got reflexivity in the stock market, reflexivity in currency markets, and and then it states the theory separately or whatever. But Soros, trying to find a quote from Soros is like, you know, it's it's all kind of his language is sort of complicated and circular and and it's hard to to pin down a decent quote. But I I think I think that's the answer. I think you're a subset of what I was talking about. And I think it's mostly what I was talking about, I still think. I still think that reflexivity and, you know, turning during a boom bust sequence, reflexivity turns the movements in the stock price into one of the fundamentals of the company whose value is expressed in the stock price, right? It's, it's, it's this feedback loop, as one of our listeners wrote in to say. And yeah, it's like a feedback loop, but it does things like it affects whole industries and, you know, it does things like make, you know, it can make equity values higher and turn companies into better creditors than they might have been, for example, for one example. And it can allow companies to issue shares at, you know, much higher multiples and they can acquire things like, you know, the REITs. Soros gives the example of REITs that were able to do that. And then another example I know are the the royalty companies like Franco Nevada. I mean, Franco Nevada is in a negative cost of capital type game where they sell, I mean, a crude way of putting it, a simplified way of putting it is, you know, they sell shares at 25 times royalties and then pay 20 times royalties, let's just say. These days, who knows? It's probably 30 and 25, whatever. But you get the point. Right, the the share price, the the rise in the share price becomes a fundamental of the industry, and I'm going to stick with that. I, I really, you sound like you're challenging that, but I don't think ultimately that you are. I think you're just adding a, a different type of example with your Apple example. But it's a good question, and it's an interesting topic. Next is Mac W wrote in, and he says, "Thanks, Dan, for your last episode. I look forward to listening each week." 
upon recommendations from Stansbury newsletters over the last few years, I have traded ETFs on occasion. After this episode, I feel like I now understand ETFs much better. I'm currently looking for a way to short zombie companies. With the strong performance of the market over the last few months, it seems like this would be a great time to have an ultra short zombie ETF. I'm going to stop right there, Mac. I think that's a phenomenal idea. Phenomenal. You need to write into ProShares and whoever else and, and tell them to create the zombie, ultra short zombie ETF. I, I just wanted to tell everyone about your great idea and tell you that I fully support you. I mean, if Stansberry were in that business, we should be creating, you know, a, a zombie ETF, short zombie ETF. Good idea. Next comes Jeff F. And Jeff says, hi, Dan, keep up the great work. Look forward to your podcast every week. Regarding Soros, he said convexivity, but Jeff, it's reflexivity. Seems like a fancy word for watching a feedback loop, not the loop itself. Big deal. Things feed on themselves until they can't or don't. These are the results of a system, not initial conditions. I mean, yeah. That, yeah that, I mean, that sounds, it sounds like you basically understand it. Then he says, Bitcoin, I did not like it at all for a very long time, electricity consumption, etc. but I keep kept looking at the chart. It's bullish. And then he says, the rise of Bitcoin is due to distrust and abuse of vampire central banksters and government. Bitcoin is the first thing they can't pervert because they can't manipulate the supply. This is the first currency crisis where people actually have an option. Central banks, governments are dead jerks walking. I don't store value in manipulatable things anymore. Why would I? I want a free market. I want truth. Others do too. That's why Bitcoin is rising. Best, Jeff. So, Jeff, I think this is probably not the first currency crisis where people actually have an option because they could always buy gold before, right? So, I, I disagree with that one small point. But overall, I, I, I agree. I, do, I also think that central banks and governments are dead jerks walking. I love that expression. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Next comes Christian K. And he says, hi, Dan. Question for the next podcast. I'm an extreme value subscriber and frequent podcast listener. Recently, it seems like I have been hearing a lot about a negative outlook for gold this year, while prices of other commodities, such as copper, etc., are forecasted to go up if slash when we do see inflation rise. I am a bit confused as it was always my understanding that gold prices should rise in an inflationary environment as real rates decline. I thought that was a big part of the reason for gold store of value attractiveness. Thanks for taking the time to read my question. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Christian K. Um, Christian, it sounds like, first point here, sounds like you're talking about forecasts. Don't listen to the forecasts. Just don't. Nobody knows the future. It makes sense that things, if you think the value of dollars is going to fall, which is what we mean by inflation, ultimately, that the value of things priced in dollars is going to rise, including gold. Now, if you say gold has underperformed your expectations in the past year or so, I mean, I might agree with that. It did hit 2000 bucks. I'm just going to say, but I, I, kind of, I kind of feel you on that one because I own gold and gold related stocks. So I'm focused on this problem as well, but I don't know. I, I don't think it's a permanent state of affairs. I don't. I think gold is as attractive as it's ever been at, for all the same reasons. What is hard to do right now is to turn your eyes and ears away from Bitcoin because that is all that anyone wants to hear about or talk about or know about and, you know, own. <laughs> so it kind of makes other things, especially assets that appear to be competing directly with it, like gold, seem less attractive. But I think it's a, it's, it's chimerical. It's not, it's a, it's not the truth. It's just a function of this sort of bubbly moment in technology, specifically Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Am I saying Bitcoin is in a bubble? No. Or am I? This is a tough topic for me. I'm going to move on to the next question. And 
it, it, it pertains to the same thing. So, so maybe I'll get to keep talking about this. So this is Steve. This is our last question. And Steve writes in and says, loved your chat with Eric Wade. So educational to frame Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Following up on your comments to thematic ETFs, he copied this link in from MarketWatch on February the 18th. And the headline is, Bitcoin could hit $250,000 if U.S. companies opt to do this, says Kathy Wood. And then he says, blowing smoke up your own dot, dot, dot. What he's saying there is this headline, Kathy Wood in this article on Bloomberg said, or on MarketWatch, sorry, she said, if all the corporate treasuries you know, all the corporations would do the same thing as Tesla and, you know, MicroStrategy and Square and these other companies that have bought Bitcoin with their corporate cash, you know, as part of the treasury, then Bitcoin could would hit $250,000. And I don't know, she's not wrong, probably, right? If, if, if corporations right and left started putting money into Bitcoin, I'm sure it would shove the price straight up. So, yeah. I agree with, I don't know how likely it is that that'll happen, but I do think other corporations will follow suit and do it. But you're right. She is blowing. I think in the, in the military, Steve, in your question here, I think they would say you're blowing sunshine at that point. Smoke is, is bad. Sunshine is good, right? So Steve continues. He says, now a couple of questions. Paying with Bitcoin. How does this work? Do you exchange Bitcoin or change your Bitcoin or or a USDC stablecoin to transfer to the vendor supplier. Thinking with current volatility, how do you manage to keep the invoice value? Yeah, I mean, there, there's two questions. The mechanics of it are, you know, I give you Bitcoin, you give me stuff, and then you probably immediately transfer translate your Bitcoin into dollars, right? And and you assess the dollar value the split second before the transaction, and you say, this is what we're, you know, this is what you're really paying. So it's really just dollars at this point. You know, and, and look, I'm a Bitcoin supporter. I own Bitcoin. I've recommended it in my newsletter. But you have to acknowledge reality or else, you know, you're creating risk for yourself. And the reality is when you buy something with Bitcoin, what do you do? You look at the price in dollars right before you buy it. You give them that much Bitcoin, right? <laughs> and then they take the Bitcoin. They probably just sell it for dollars, you know? So... That is my real answer to your question, which the main part of that question was about the volatility and the invoice value of whatever you're buying, right? That's the only way I can see to do it. Assess the price in dollars the split second before the transaction. Second question, number two, you say, the concentration risk, does this pose an issue as an article I recently read copied below? And the article says, there are currently 11 wallets with outbound payments since 2014 holding a total of 273,182 Bitcoin. As soon as one of these whales, large holders, sell their Bitcoins, the price will decline firmly. And then he continues, are there parallels with major shareholders in the equity market, albeit without SEC disclosure and controls? Finally, and then he gives me a speaker suggestion here, which I didn't copy into this. Into this. But, but the point is, is 273,182 Bitcoin, if these people who own, these 11 people who own this Bitcoin, if they sold, you know, some significant portion of that, how meaningful would it be? Well, look, at any moment, like if they, if they came into the market and hit the sell button on 273,000 Bitcoin, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there, there'd probably be some temporary oversupply and the price would drop to adjust for it. But what I want to know is, is, is that just another dip to buy? You see what I'm saying, Steve? It, it, you got to ask, out of 18, there's 18, probably close to 19 million. I haven't kept up. I don't keep up with it every day. But it was edging pretty close toward 19 million last time I looked. So, you know, just say 19 million Bitcoin out there out of an ultimate, you know, 21 million someday. Is 273,000 enough to just destroy the market? Yeah, maybe for a day or a half hour. Or, you know, some short period of time that probably doesn't mean anything, Right. And, and suppose we're going along nicely and then that happens. Like how many people are going to buy that dip and how many people are going to panic and sell? Can't know that. But I, I just think that the effect that you're describing, Steve, is, is probably temporary and probably long term doesn't mean a whole lot. And when you say, you know, are there parallels with major shareholders in the equity market? Well, 
I don't no, I don't think so. Maybe just the temporary effect because in the equity market, a, a major shareholder. Now, if it's like you know the typical, you know, if it's if it's Fidelity or something or BlackRock, you know, they own these things in funds and ETFs or whatever. Like they're not there because they know the business and they've you know owned the shares for thirty years or something, right? They're just there because the market cap is big enough to go in one of their funds. So when they sell, eh, who cares? But if the founding shareholder who owns you know forty percent of the stock sells you know, 70% of his stake. Hey, that could mean something. But to your question, Steve, I don't think that's what, I don't think it's the same as if those 11 folks sold some portion of their Bitcoin. So even some large portion of their Bitcoin, it's, it's different. They don't own a piece of a company where they're in, where they're, you know, knowledgeable with the day-to-day operations or even in control of the day-to-day operations. You understand? It's 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 different. So at least that's my take. Do do with it what you will. But it's it's a good question. It's worth asking, and it's worth knowing about those eleven people, right? You know, you see a, you see a lot of Bitcoin hit the market all of a sudden. Well, I guess we know where it came from. Thank you, Steve. Excellent question. That's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're listening to this episode and you really enjoyed it, first of all, thank you. Second of all, send somebody else a link to the podcast so that we can continue to grow. Anybody you know who might enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. If you want to hear more from Stansberry Research, check out AmericanConsequences.com slash podcast. Do us a favor. Subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle there is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note at feedback at InvestorHour.com or give us a call at our new listener feedback line. Call us at 800-381-2357 and tell us what's on your mind. That's 800-381-2357. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.